Welcome to Bottled Petrichor, a podcast dedicated to discussing key topics in Islamic history and thought. In addition to a short lecture at the start of most episodes, we ask our guest experts questions submitted by listeners and allow them to share their thoughts in a safe environment. Please visit our Twitter page for feedback and question submission forms. Thank you, and I hope you enjoy. Hello, I'm very pleased to have Dr. Shadi al Masri as a guest today. Welcome and thanks for being here. Uh, thank you. My pleasure. I wanted to start off by asking you a bit about your own background, educational and otherwise, and what got you interested in the study of theology? So uh, when I was young, the uh, community that I was in, we we're an immigrant community, we we're from uh, Egyptians, and like most immigrant communities, they come from countries that have a culture, have a certain type of uh, set of morals, and a lot of people are trying to... Uh, protect these morals. So the only, the best way, the simplest way to protect these morals is to have some kind of a religion. And so like many Egyptian families, uh, my family, they gravitated toward, at a certain age, we gravitated towards uh, the Muslims. And in the beginning, there weren't really many uh, uh, teachers around, but eventually there were some Shiu who came over and were very good influences. And then certain things happened that caused us to be close to some of them. And I, uh, you know, I, I like the uh, Sakina and the sense of wholeness. And uh, it just felt like it was, you know, something good and something right. So I ended up uh, pursuing it. And then ultimately, when there were some converts who came in, they actually bridged a gap that a lot of people had, which is that where we didn't really relate culturally to any of our, uh, any of the Shiu. There was like zero cultural relation. So uh, when I saw American convert Chiu, I actually became more interested in them because they were able to bridge the gap between culture and Dean. And you have to have every you have to have both. Culture is something that culture is like it's everything that, uh, you know, that you can't necessarily categorize in one thing. It's it's something that is so ubiquitous that you can't escape it. So you have to have a matching culture to everything. So you can't have uh, any type of movement within a community that's against the culture that it's in. So that was really important for me. And, uh, you know, thanks to them and their efforts and their work, I was able to, you know, bridge those gaps and then move forward from there. So that's really how I got into it. In terms of other interests, you know, in terms of Islamic studies, do you have any? Uh, I know you're doing some stuff with Quranic studies, and you also do teaching. I wasn't uh, uh, a, like a type of um, specialist in anything per se, but I like to. I like the philosophy of Imam Haddad, which was a balance of knowledge and personal def- spirituality, and giving back. And for students of knowledge, that means teaching, and. This is uh, summarized in a phrase by Habib Omar as Ilm Suluk Dawa. So knowledge, uh, Suluk, which is personal spiritual uh, improvement and development and sanctification through dhikr. And, and then Dawa, teaching. So I like the balance. I didn't like to specialize. Imam Haddad said that the Da'i should be balanced in his knowledge. He should be uh, capable of taking everyone from uh, uh, absolute ignorance to being a strong student of knowledge in all the fields. So that means we're going to focus on Tawheed, we're going to focus on Arabic grammar, uh, logic, fiqh, ibadat, mu'amalat, tasawwuf, aqidah, hadith, Qur'an. You're going to have to have a balance. Tajweed, you need to have a balance. But you also need to be a balanced person because in order to reach people, you need to be a balanced person. So you need to not be simply someone who is a one-track person. So that the person, like you interact with them only in one setting and not in any other setting. I wasn't really a big believer in that, uh, at least for myself. I don't want it for myself. Yes, there are mashayikh, great mashayikh, right, in the past. But that was acceptable in the past. It was, it was a norm in the past. Today, your community members, people, they're going to see you in different environments. You're going to be in different environments. So a person has to have a adaptability and so that's where the balance comes in. You need to be a balanced person, and in your knowledge, you need to be balanced. So if you don't if you don't live a balanced life, you won't know how other people live. And if you don't 
if you don't know how other people live, then you won't be able to reach them. So I felt it was pretty important for me to sort of get out of the mold uh, of the student and the sheikh and the worshiper and the dhakr and the abid to, to, to add to that mold. Not get out of it like permanently, but to be able to be multifunctional, right? So I can function in, in, in different capacities that don't contradict one another. Uh, I felt that that was important to be able to know what the live life is like for the people that you're trying to reach. And if you don't know what that live life is like, then you're handicapped. You won't be able to ever reach them. And this model has certainly worked. There are a lot of people on Twitter who respect you a great deal. Yeah, the the idea of, of being approachable was, was very important to Imam al-Haddad as well. And he was my, my example, really, even though, of course, he passed, he, he lived three centuries ago. But I spent my time reading his work, and I just loved every bit of the balance in his work and the um, the doability. It was something doable. It was something that you could do. It's not. It wasn't something that was so uh, uh, ambitious that it was impossible, and the only way that you could ever achieve it was to live an odd life of either like a loner or, or something like that, where met, there are a lot of fields in order to advance in those fields, uh, you, you had to be odd. Well, he, he was quite the opposite. He was like, we have to be practical. Right. And uh, he was a pragmatist in the sense that when he had students that were going very deep in their studies, he, he would pull them back and say, don't forget to look around you. Don't get lost in your subject. Look around you at the society because the actual purpose of knowledge is to reach people. So if reaching people with an idea is not possible because the idea is too complicated or otherwise, then there is something wrong with it. So he was a practical, he was a pragmatist, and he was very much focused upon uh, reaching people, whether it be for a simple science or otherwise. So I felt that there was another, there's another element, which is the scholar who really holds the banner of Imam Haddad today, Habib Omar bin Hafid uh, in Tarim Yemen, he uses technology, and there was a school of thought in Tarim as well that said that we shouldn't use this technology because it would be a type of um, uh, a new thing that we don't know where it will take us. Well, one of the answers that one of the Mashiach gave was Allah gave us this technology, and if we and people are using it for the evil, you know, for evil. Uh, if we don't use it for good, we may be asked by Allah, why don't we use technology? So. He encouraged the use of any type of platform to express Tawheed, right? So to counterbalance whatever is uh, uh, whatever is being, and most of, I mean, most use of technology is good, but there are ideas that are problematic, okay? And if we don't take advantage and we get beat to the ball on all of those uh, platforms, then we're going to regret it later on. So he was a proponent of using every possible method to reach people. You know, I remember growing up in, uh, you know, somewhat conservative circles where people would say, you know, videos and these things are completely impermissible. And now those same people, they're using videos, uh, you know, as a tool for teaching. So it's yeah. just interesting. I, there, there's going to be pros and cons to everything. There are pros and cons to the written word, right? There are probably way more pros than cons because the Quran swears by the pen. Allah swears by the pen. And the written word is the mode of revelation, right? Allah Ta'ala has chosen this, the written word for a reason. So the written word is the most superior mode after the speech. So Allah, if you notice, Quran always says, the hearing, the seeing, right? as wal basar, the hearing first. Because they, everyone can be reached by the hearing. But much, men, more fewer, fewer people will be reached by reading, okay? So uh, the speech and the book are still the greatest uh, uh, forms of communication between people. And then everything else is really a sort of um, distant, not a distant, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, you know those old toys where it has little pieces in it, you look into it like a, micro, like a, a telescope and you turn, the, you turn the toy and it's like a kaleidoscope, right? So the kaleidoscope, Every other piece of technology is a kaleidoscope that uh, transmits the, the speech and the written word, right? Oh. So this is what we're looking at, uh, the speech and the written word. Uh, you know, some things are worse than others. Some things are bad. Some things are good, have more cons than pros. But 
uh, I don't get into overanalyzing the world as it is because you find that's I, I found that it's a waste of time, right? I don't overanalyze the world as it is. I take it as it is and work with it to the best of my capabilities. If there are cons, you try to struggle against the cons, right? But this whole idea of live a completely alternative lifestyle, uh, go against the grain, you end up using so much energy going against the grain of the world that that energy could have been used, you know, for some better purpose. And you're going to go against the grain and uh, enter into some unknown, right? So I, I don't overanalyze the world that we live in uh, or go into, you know, takes on alternative everything, whether it's medicine, technology. I'm not into that, right? Uh, I'll just take the world as it is. And yeah, okay, there are some ideas that I want to change, but in terms of the structures, te technology, uh, medicine, these major things, I'm not going to be a revolutionary in these fields, right? I'm just going to take it as it is, right? And and there are cons. We analyze it, and you try to avoid the cons. I mean, cell phones to me have the biggest cons, and they and we are really failing in being uh, having the courage really to recognize some of these cons. And you have parents who are. Uh, making big mistakes like I've been saying recently you would never allow a stranger to come in and say hey I'm going to sit in a box in a glass box go into your kid's room and spend the night with them I won't touch him right I will not touch him okay uh, but I'll entertain him all night and anything goes okay so what parent would in the right mind would even think about that even if he told you I'm going to be in a plastic box that's locked Right. I will never touch your kid. OK. But just put me and let me entertain your kid for the evening with jokes, with whatever. But anything goes. Well, how is this any different from a cell phone? Think about it. Kids got a cell phone and behind that piece of glass, it's anything goes. And, and, and we're these. This is our future. These kids are our future. They could be your future in-laws too, son-in-law, daughter-in-law. They're your future leaders, right? They're the future heads of organizations, right? So we have to care about uh, how they're growing up and what they're being exposed to. If we take an attitude of, well, these are all personal decisions, you're going to be in trouble because those personal decisions are going to enter your homes in the form of friend, your kids as friends, your kids as uh, husbands and wives, okay? The parents of your grandkids. So if you didn't contribute anything, to how we as a community, you know, raise, you know, just talk about how kids should be raised, then when that happens and you put your hands up for protection and du'a, your du'a won't be answered because you didn't do anything. Allah gave you the chance, right? You, I don't know what your background is, right? But you're doing this podcast. So you're trying to do something, right? You got to take action. And this world, I mean, with technology today, everyone can take action. Right. Everyone can talk. It's not like the olden days where, you know, you had to go through hoops. And by the time you're 40, maybe your opinion matters. We're not like that. So we have to exert our will and try to put an effect in our society. Uh, Sheikh, I wanted to move right along into the meat of the matter, which okay. is uh, basically theology and asking the important questions. So I want to start it off by asking questions which establish the fundamentals. So the first being. How do we establish that there is a God? All right. Quite simply, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made for us um, uh, his existence. Certain attributes of his existence are rationally attainable. And the first idea is that uh, our the very existence of our even discussing this subject indicates that there is something greater than us. Right. That there there must be something greater than us. There must be something that possesses ability greater than us. Right. So we won't define that. We'll just say that we will admit this first element, which is that there is some something that possesses force. Right. The, the ability to put this universe in order and, and give it to us. So that we call it in Arabic qudra or ability. So the, just the fact that we're even talking about the subject a, the, by default, something before us had to have ability. So that's the first attribute. Now, when you look at this, the nature of the world, 
you find in it that it's orderly. It's very orderly and it's very systematic. So I, I was praying the Lord just now and right in my front yard, there were birds uh, going for the grass. Now, birds don't go for the grass in the afternoon, right? By the afternoon, by this hour, they're, they've eaten their food, right? So I also open the window and I find it's humid. So we know just by these two factors that uh, it's going to rain, probably going to rain. Maybe it'll have a little bit of a drizzle, okay, or something. So this world is so orderly. The animals know when it's going to rain in advance because they would suffer the most, right? Human beings, we, we already have homes. We're able to build roofs. We actually don't possess that, you know, uh, innately in ourselves. We don't know necessarily it's going to rain. You see these animals live in perfect harmony with the world and with each other. You know, deers, the way they live, and their population of deers is always something that's really interesting to, to look at. Whenever there are too many deers, all of a sudden you're going to have deforestation, like the foliage. They're going to destroy the foliage. They destroy the foliage. The wells will start uh, – the, 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 the trees, they're supposed to pick up the water. They're supposed to, they, they pull water, right? So if you have deforestation – the water in the ground will not rise up because it's the trees that pull them up with their veins. Well, if you didn't have, if you have too many deer, okay, or if you have too little deer at the same time, you have too much foliage, okay? You got way too much, uh, too many trees, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, everything is in an, uh, such an amazing balance that uh, you can't deny that's in a perfect balance. So what does that indicate to us? That indicates that this, whatever this force is, it's a, it's a single force. It's not two forces, right? If, there were, if it was two forces, there would be conflict, right? And the only time we see conflict is in the only creature that has willpower, the human being. Right? You never see the, the lions have a genocide of zebras. You never see the uh, moon, you know, trying to fight with the earth, okay? The sun doesn't, you know, go on strike and say, I'm, uh, you know, I'm not... Uh, I'm, gonna, I'm not going to give light anymore. You never see the earth saying, forget this, I'm turning around and going the other way. You have absolute harmony, okay? So absolute harmony indicates oneness and it indicates order. And order is always indicated by oneness. So by reason alone, we know that whatever this force is, it is one. When you look at the, the individual entities of the world, you find them uh, and, and you look at the environment as a whole. You find that these, this world requires many, many things all right, to come together at once. You can't have this universe come together piece by piece. Right? So if I, if I needed to make $100, it's easy. I'll make a buck, save it, and then repeat that practice 100 times. Right? I just, so it could take me 100 days and I'll get $100. However, if I need to, uh, to juggle three balls, right, you can't juggle one ball today, two balls tomorrow, right? You have to do them all at once, or otherwise it's not called juggling. Likewise, a human being, if you look at his con construction and the construction of the environment at, uh, at large, it requires everything to come together all at once. Not one day this, next day this, next day that. So the eye, for example, had to come together all at once. The human, be the human being had to be made all at once. So you can't have... Let's make a heart first, okay? And now you have a very simple human being. All he has is a heart. Then let's case his or then let's create a, a heart with a brain. Now you have a more complex human being. Now you have let's make a human being with a brain and a heart and uh, a bones. Let's give him bones. And then he's walking around as brain, heart, and bones. Then let's add muscles, right? Then let's add let's cover him up in skin. Then let's give him eyes. Then let's give him an intellect. Blah blah blah. So. That does it. Uh, the human being can't be like that. What you had is not a human being. It's just nothing, right? So a human being had to come together all at once. So whenever anything has to come together all at once, you realize that this process was thought out. Okay, it was thought out, and this is called complexity. Something is complex, meaning that it it was thought out. It was a process, right? Of of something that uh, indicates knowledge. Right? Something that possesses knowledge. So knowledge becomes the third attribute. So we have ability, oneness, and knowledge so far. 
you then uh, look at the world and you say, okay, well, every human being looks different. Every zebra stripe is different. Every snowflake is different. So things are created different. There's a, that, and that's not necessary, right? I mean, we could have human beings just called human being one, human being two, human being three, right? And then, you know, when human being one dies, then we could use his number again. Right. And so on and so forth. Just the way the way we make cars, for example, you make a car. There's no time to make a new a different model variation of a, of a car. Every single time you produce cars. So you create VIN numbers. Right. So it's a let's say a Honda Civic, you know, 2018. And then it's just the VIN number because all Honda Civics 2018, they look the same. So but when you look at the world, you find the opposite of this. You find everything looks different. And sometimes things look different for no obvious reason, right? There's, it seems there's no function to why they look the way they look. Like, why are peacocks blue? Why are zebras black and white? Okay. Why are, you know, the, why are horses in those different colors? So there's no necessarily a function for these things. And anyone who tries to drive, a lot of times they're, they're really stretching it when they try to drive a function. So sometimes it's just different for its sake. What does that indicate to us? That indicates to us volition or willfulness, what we call in Arabic irada, that this creator is putting things in the universe because he wants to, okay, out of his own will, as opposed to like a machine that's spinning. Now, a machine has no will, right? You, the machine is just programmed. So how do we know that we're not in a programmed machine? And the answer is that there's variation. There's constant variation. OK, so and this variation is complicated too. every single fingertip is different. Every iris is different. So variation is a stamp. Everything is very variated. Right. So that's uh, the fourth attribute of variation. Uh, you cannot have any of these attributes and be dead at the same time. So we know that this is a lot. This cr this creator is alive, that whatever this thing is, is alive, is height. Okay. And creation cannot exist, cannot have a creator who's blind, right? So we know that he possesses sight, okay? And that this creator has created for us the ability to communicate. And one of the highest, you know, things in, in our uh, attributes for human beings that separate us from animals is communication. So communication is a laudable thing. It's a, it's a virtuous thing. And the, the better someone can communicate, the greater, you know, his power is. So the absence of communication, the ability to communicate is uh, a flaw. So you won't be a creator if he cannot, if he's dumb. In other words, dumb meaning not stupid, but meaning can't communicate. So um, uh, we know that this creator uh, can speak as well. He must be able to speak. Otherwise, you know, his life is different. His existence would be different. And then lastly, nothing can have all this except that it exists too, right? So we said he is one. He has ability. He has knowledge. He has will. He is alive. He hears. He speaks. And he, uh, he, is, he exists at wujud. But also we have to come to the realization that he's completely outside of this universe of cause and effect, right? Because if this universe had a beginning, and we know for sure that this universe had a beginning, then therefore this, the, all the laws of the universe didn't exist. And therefore, none of the laws of the universe apply to this being. So cause and effect does not apply to this being. Time does not apply to this being. Space does not apply to this being, okay? Uh, it is not in a location, all right? Uh, because a location is, is, is a, is part of is a space it's an it's a location is a physical space okay and therefore if he existed before the existence of all space right therefore he himself has no space he has no place he has no location so he is a superior beyond location we call this tenzi okay munazzah an zamani wal makan okay so he is transcendent beyond time and place because what is time Time is the inter the relationship between two material objects, right? So if you didn't have the sun, for example, we wouldn't be able to measure our time. If we didn't have gravity, right, 
between two material objects. Our time would be different. So time is in fact a function of volume, all right? And volume is a function of location. So all these things are all interconnected. So uh, he is munazza. And this is called Mukhalafat al Hawad. And it's summarized in Surah Al Ikhlas when it says, uh, Allah is Samad, He is Samad, absolutely independent. That means He's independent from cause, effect, time, place, everything. And He is different from, Walam Yakullahu Kufun Ahad. There's nothing like unto, <clears throat> unto Him. So, with our intellect alone, we could come up with His oneness, His existence, His knowledge, all of these attributes just with the intellect. And if you look at the Quranic critique of paganism, it does not say, have you received, uh, why, why do you worship gods, have you not received my message? The Quran does not say this. The Quran rather says, don't you think, do you not have intellect? Okay. The Quran attacks paganism as being something that contradicts the pure intellect. And there were a, a people, a small amount of people, but they existed, called the Sabians or as sabiin who never heard of a prophet or messenger, and just using their intellect were able to negate the, the, the uh, uh, divinity of pagan gods and realize that there was one God. Now, the Sabi'in had no way of giving a name to this God. They had no way of knowing his attributes. But with their intellect alone, they knew that God is, uh, or that the, there is a creator, and he is not what these idols are, right? And he must be one creator, and he's not what these idols are. The Quran says these idols cannot benefit you or harm you, right? So uh, uh, these idols can't hear or see. So these are some of, this is a basic summary of understanding the oneness of the creator uh, with the intellect alone, right? Now, if you look at the critique of the Jews and Christians, it does not resort to the intellect, right? It, said, it says, you know, have you not received the message? It always points to the prophet, peace be upon him. Like, you know about this prophet. Your fathers know him. You know him better than your fathers. In other words, the prophecies about this messenger in your, in your book. So it appeals to scripture, revelation, prophethood, okay? So the hadith of the prophet, any Jew or Christian who hears about me, all right, but does not believe in me, okay, is in the fire. So when it comes to the people of the book, the, Qur the Qur'an is constantly looking at uh, prophethood because you need to have been told certain things. You need to have received the message to enter into Islam. But all you need to avoid paganism is an intellect. Okay, thank you for that. A um, couple questions, follow-up questions. How does the theory of evolution tie in with this or does it not tie in with any of this? Is it Does it affect the model that's been created or... Can it be used to help the model? The uh, theory of evolution is a speculative deduction using analogy. Okay, and what matters to a Muslim is that could ha could Allah have created through evolution? Uh, Allah can. Yeah, there's nothing beyond the bounds of Allah except what He prohibited for Himself, and contradictory things are not things to begin with. So that if someone says, can God create a square circle? Uh, because if he, uh, if he can't, you know, then, then he's not all powerful. Or if he can create a, a, a rock that he can't lift, then he's not, all, uh, uh, he's not uh, omnipotent. Okay? But we say that contradictory things are uh, not things to begin with. So they're not even into the discussion of can God do it. So square circles are not things. Unliftable rocks are not things. Liftability is a function of the one doing the lifting. That's the first thing, right? So lift, unliftable rock is something that doesn't exist because it can only exist relative to the lifter, right? Uh, and therefore, we would say the rock weighs a certain amount, but the lifter has, is limited at a certain amount. So unliftability is not a function or a, a property of rocks when, when, they, when the atheists bring that trick. And that's like a simple one. Uh, so the, two, the only thing that Allah cannot do is what he himself prohibited upon himself, such as oppression. He will not oppress anyone. Uh, or oppression meaning that someone does something good and they don't get rewarded, or they suffer and they don't get compensated, 
Okay, and uh, not only rewarded, but compensated. There's a difference between reward and compensation. Believers get rewarded and non-believers get compensated. There's a difference. So he compensates everything good that you do and he compensates every harm that you suffer. Okay, so that's his justice. Uh, and things that are contradictory are not things at all. So could God create a human being from a non-human being? The answer is yes. But he has told us that he didn't do so. And this is the problem. So the problem is with this, the Quran being so clear that in three times that Adam was created as salsal in kal He was made from a pot like hardened clay. That at, there was a point in time when he was that, right? So there's no mammal ever in a hardened clay uh, phase, okay? So evolution by itself, it is impossible by the Quran for Adam to have had a mother or a father, okay, to have had to have been in the womb of another woman, to be the product of another mammal, all right, uh, or whatever you want to call the whatever would have preceded Adam. Uh, so anyone philosophizing on uh, theological, uh, theistic evolution, I should say, is it's just so silly. It's so impossible. It's really a refutation that's uh, a, a first year student can can do like if there was an islamic college this is not something the professors would even write about the first year students would gather the ahadith would gather the verses of the quran would look at the meanings of certain words like salsal and kalfakhar okay would compile all of this and a first year student who knows arabic and who has access to uh, a hadith can write this refutation of theistic evolution it has zero traction in terms of evidence. Zero. Absolute. It's, it's, seal, it's airtight. The belief that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created Adam directly himself using water and clay. Okay. So that there, there's really, uh, there's no going there if you're a respectable, uh, you know, theologian. Uh, you, you wouldn't even... You wouldn't even become a theologian. Your teachers would expel you if this was your belief. They would just laugh at you. I mean, if I went in to um, become a physician, a pediatrician, and my platform as a medical student was that I'm going to teach all the youth that homosexuality is is uh, a the beginning of diseases and don't do it and do not have sex outside of marriage, right? the medical establishment will just laugh me out of my profession, right? We all understand that, right? Nobody would disagree. If I wanted to be a Democrat and I'm getting up there and I'm saying, listen, I think we need to rethink diversity and we should really uh, pin the truth to be what the, you know, uh, the Bible says, as that's what, tr what, what the truth is, okay? You're going to be laughed out. You won't even make it to become a Democratic candidate in anything. OK, so in order to arrive at certain uh, pinnacles or, you know, terminal posts in a profession, in a field, you cannot make certain contradictions. Well, in Islamic scholarship, you cannot go against. Right. If you're a student of theology against the idea that Allah created Adam directly that your your teachers, your peers, your institutions will just laugh you out. You'll, you won't even be refuted. You'll just be laughed at because it's it, there's no room for it at all in the verses on the ahadith. So that's the take, and that's what every Muslim must know, and they should they should know it, and it's not that difficult. It's literally, the evidence is so simple. It's as simple as that, the fact that there's one God in five prayers and hajjahs in Mecca, okay? So... Uh, anytime that someone tells you it's complicated, it's their mind that's complicated and they're trying to jam a square circle, a square screw into a uh, round peg. OK, it's not going to happen. It's a very simple issue. As for evolution itself, I, that's I, I don't really care for negating evolution itself. Right. What the concern of every imam and scholar should be is the corruption of what's called Islam. Right. What people are calling Islam. So uh, corruption of the inside of Islam. As for evolution itself, others can go and uh, try to get involved and show its own uh, inconsistencies. And you don't even need to, to be honest. 
every scientific idea will get undermined from within. Okay, so Muslims have, uh, or and Christians too. There's there's two different things. There's the undermining of a heretical idea, and there's replacing it with your idea. Okay, you don't need to worry about replacing it. You don't need to do two steps. You just need to do one step, and that and every idea will undermine its every man-made idea will undermine itself eventually, right? So you didn't have to replace communism with Islam. Communism itself will self-implode. Likewise, it's already happening that. Uh, Darwinism is itself evolving outside of Darwinism. They're, they're, def- they're just discovering enough within uh, the community, the scientific community, to have enough voices. I think there's a thousand on some petitions out there, uh, basically simply declaring that um, the model doesn't work with it from within. Now, that doesn't mean they're going to replace it with a better model. I mean, they might replace it with a worse one, right, for Muslims. But these ideas get... Uh, displaced and refuted from within. Okay, so it's going to happen by itself. But our concern should be what are people saying when they're attempting to represent the word of God and his prophet? That's the job of imams and scholars. Okay, so all I need to know is where the problem lies. All right, so and when it comes to communism, I don't need to be to go into, you know, socialism. Communism. I'm going to look at where it doesn't fit. Okay where it doesn't fit. And that's all that a regular Muslim needs to know. So the idea of communism, right, it doesn't fit and it's not allowed to deny private property, right? To deny people the right to possess uh, land and property and wealth and blah, 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 right? I mean, it's just incongruous with the texts, with what we know about Islam, and it's a one-line refutation or or a one-line declaration of incompatibility. How about that? That's actually much better. Because it's not a refutation, it's a refutation that it's compatible. So it's not compatible. These ideas are not compatible with Islam, right? So those declarations could be very simple, right? And that's what that's my take on theistic evolution. And nobody who I've ever debated was able to, you know, squeeze it in. And yes, Qadi debated some people out in, in England on the subject. Uh, you can't squeeze it. It's just a silly idea. So evolution, as we understand it, is mutually incompatible with... The evolution, of, the evolution of the human being. Okay, but animal evolution and plant evolution is okay. Uh, if you want to believe that uh, lions evolved from you know, uh, pink panthers, you can believe that all you want. If you want to believe that giraffes evolved out of cotton candy, you can believe that all you want and you will die a Sunni Muslim and we'll bury you and we'll make dua for you, right? I think it's a ludicrous idea, right? But uh, as for animal evolution, if a person believed in that, that's fine. You want to believe that? You can believe that. You can believe in pink panthers. You can believe in a lot of different things related to animals. We don't necessarily have doctrines on the origin Uh, of animals you know islam didn't come to give us a biology class but uh you want to believe in um in evolution of animals i know you want to believe in the evolution of uh frogs and lettuce and tomatoes that's up to you okay so and any evidence whether it be from dna or fossil evidence which might show connections uh with human beings um that should be discarded because according to the quran this is simply impossible. Well, according to the Quran and also according to epistemology. So epistemology is the question of where does certainty come from? Where do we get our knowledge from? And revelation is the first source. And actually, the, some scholars said something better that the ijma, the consensus the, of the interpretation of revelation is the actual real source. Uh so it's revelation first, and then you're going to have logic second, because no discovery can negate a logical statement. And then you're going to have uh, tajribi knowledge, or knowledge that is based on observation and repetition. Okay, And that's the order. So no knowledge based on repetition can ever dislodge a logical statement. And a logical statement is when you have premise A, is a factual statement. Premise B is a factual statement. They overlap in the middle and produce for us premise C. 
right? Uh, like in any in any book, they'll tell you Socrates is a man. All men are mortal. In other words, they die. No man lives forever. Therefore, Socrates is mortal. That's a basic idea of what a logical statement is. If you have two facts and they overlap in a certain part, then the, they produce for you a third fact. Okay, no observation at all can ever alter a logical statement provided that premise A and B are facts. Okay, so the order is revelation, uh, logic, and reason, and uh, observation. So, and how is revelation number one? How is it number one? Yeah, how is it established that it's one number one? Well, the revelation is established, number one, for Muslims. After belief in the Prophet, okay. Once, That's once, true. yeah, well, revelation is number one by virtue of intellect, right? And the, what I mean by that, by virtue of logic and reason, what I mean by that is how do people come to believe in the Prophet, they look at him, yeah, let's say look at how the early Muslims, some of them believed. They looked at the Master, they looked at his life. They looked at all of the precedent in his life and they deduced it's impossible for him to be crazy. It's impossible for him to be a poet. It's impossible for him to claim uh, to be uh, a, a sorcerer. It's impossible for him to just be deluded because he's, he's, his other behavior is so balanced and rational and mature that it's, he's not deluded. So therefore, he must be truthful. Right. So. Likewise, they, how did they look at the Qur'an? It's clearly not the word of a poet. It's clearly not the word of the Qur'an. It, uh, I mean, the word of uh, uh, Sha'ad of the Prophet It's not the word, the work of any Arab, right? So, but here we are in the middle of a, of a vacuum of a desert here in, in Arabia. So where did it come from? Therefore, Muhammad must be true because Muhammad was not crazy, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. He's not crazy, deluded, sorcerer, or, or did he plagiarize because he doesn't read and write? Nor is he ambitious, right? Uh, none of those things showed in his life. And in fact, if he's doing anything, he's destroying all of his uh, uh, everything uh, that he wanted. If he wanted to be a king, he's actually ruining it by this message, right? So all of this stuff leads you to the truthfulness of the Prophet ﷺ, who's telling you now that the Qur'an is the word of Allah. So reason itself comes together and says, you either believe that this is true, or you must believe in something absurd, something that is contradictory to what you know. So for th this is the idea behind that reason supports our acceptance of revelation. We don't accept the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu because our family accepted it. We don't accept it because it feels good. We don't accept it because it's a tradition. We accept it because we're able to put pen to paper and express in words and in facts why the, his truthfulness becomes a necessity, okay? So once we accept that fact, then revelation comes from our creator and anything that comes from the creator is superior to anything that comes from the creation. So that's how revelation becomes the number one source of knowledge. Uh, logic and reason become the second source of knowledge and, and then observation become the third source of knowledge. The, the, the information that you had mentioned to establish the honesty and truthfulness of the prophet in the Quran is all that information that we're using to establish those things. Yeah. Are they, is that information subjective? Is it is it something that we can look at and say, hmm, you know, I don't know about this, or is it all purely like, you know, true and objective information? It's transmitted knowledge. In other words, it's transmitted like history is transmitted. But so, transmission, oh, one can conclude about the transmission of a certain thing that it's not true. Uh, it could be transmitted, but you know, someone might say, hey, you know, we don't know if this actually goes back, and also we don't know if it reflects actually what was going on. It just might reflect, you know, what this person was thinking. Well, that's a good point. So a single transmission is not is not going to move the needle, right? One single transmission of a piece of information will not move the needle. But mass transmission does move the needle, right? So we have mass transmission based on uh, we have mass transmission on the origin and the you know the grandfather of the prophet, for example, right? Why the grandfather of the prophet is very very important in understanding why the prophet was deemed truthful because of the incidents that occurred uh, um, the incidents that occurred in the time of uh, of the prophet peace be upon him uh, or of the grandfather of the prophet peace be upon him all made the Quraysh recognize 
this that, that these are this is a special person. He had miracles. The grandfather of the prophet had you know types of miracles like discovering Zemza, the issue of the Abraha trying to destroy the Kaaba and then being uh, uh, destroyed with birds and other things like that, which we can call our I guess you can say there are miraculous things that happen around Abdul Muttalib. And Abdul Muttalib, the grandfather of the Prophet, was the reason why they all were sort of not surprised when his grandson was actually a Prophet. Okay, um, So mass transmission, which is in Arabic, mutawatir, that is one of the key, it's a very important idea in when we talk about the transmission of early Islamic uh, 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 early Islamic transmissions, okay, uh, narrations. So they come to us in mass transmission, and they come to us. And one of the great reason, uh, wisdoms behind the uh, expansion of Muslims outside of Arabia is that you now had companions moving to different cities. They're not all in Medina anymore, right? If all the companions lived and died in Medina, someone could easily say they got together and they said, let's all transmit this. But no, they would oftentimes leave Medina for good to Yemen, to Kufa in Iraq, to Basra in Iraq, to Damascus, to Jerusalem, to uh, Egypt, okay, to East Africa. So you had Sahaba all over the place, spread out. And yet, now these Sahaba will have known one another in the past, but time passes, decades pass, they're still alive, they're still teaching Islam. They end up teaching the next generation. Okay, Now, the next generation, the local Bustadin boys, the local Kufin boys, grow up to become scholars. The local Egyptians, the local Meccans, Medinans, Yemenis, Yemeni kids, they grow up to become their own scholars of the towns than the cities that they live in. But what if you now start comparing what they're saying, it's the same message. Okay, It's the same history, it's the same message. right? Which indicates that the idea that the, the companions and the second and the third generation have came together to make this up becomes actually impossible, right? It, so that's the idea of mutawatir. Mutawatir is something so widespread that it becomes impossible that people made this up, okay? And that the number of people exposed to this are so many, it's actually impossible that none of them were honest and all of them were devious or stupid, right? And that's the whole idea of whistleblowers, right? The bigger um, an organization becomes, the more likely there is for someone to be honest enough to say, hey, this is, this is a lie. This is false. This is not true, right? So, uh, and the other beauty of earliest, the first, you know, 300 years of, uh, of Islam and even less than that, is the existence of hadith criticism. So let's say someone says, well, you Muslims also came up with a doctrine that you're not allowed to criticize the Prophet. Yeah, we're not allowed to criticize the Prophet, but we are allowed to criticize transmissions about the Prophet. And so therefore you have whole books of scholars writing about one another that he transmits properly, he transmits with a faulty memory, he is an outright liar, He's an innovator, but he's an honest innovator, so you can accept everything he says besides his innovation. He's uh, astray. His transmission is horrible. His transmission is excellent. You can take whatever he says. His transmission is perfect. However, when he transmits from so-and-so, the age gap, uh, so-and-so is really old, so don't take anything he says from so-and-so because when scholars get old, they forget. Uh, so-and-so's transmissions are good, but don't take anything he says from so-and-so because he only met him when he was young, right? And little kids, you can't accept their transmission. So he was a little kid when he transmitted from so-and-so. There's even a, trans, uh, a critique of one scholar that take from him, take everything that you, you can take from him, uh, except any transmitters from Basra, okay, from Basra. Take all of his transmitters from Yemen, but not his transmitters from Basra. And the reason was that in Yemen, he had all his books. When he would go to Basra to visit his mom, he wouldn't take his books with him. So he would transmit from his memory and he would make mistakes. So when it's actually, who is it? SubhanAllah. It's, um, uh, SubhanAllah. When you teach this stuff, it's on your mind, but I haven't taught it in like 
a year and a half. It was, name starts with a ra. Anyway, I forget who it is. But he is the imam of Yemen, basically. But he's from Basra. He ends up becoming the imam of Yemen. They love him so much. They, he, they, they disallowed him from leaving. So he became their sheikh. He only said, I have to visit my mother every once in a while, like once a year. But he would go visit his mom. The transmissions that he gave in Basra were without his books. So later scholars noticed that the Basran students, his Basran students, were transmitting something different from the Yemeni students. A Sanani. Oh, it was Abdul Razak Sanani, I believe. I believe it might have been Abdul Razak Sanani. That when when he would go, I think it was him. Okay, you know, I, I don't want to say, but Abdul Razak might have been his student. But in any event, they they would say that when he writes. Uh, his students from Yemen, their transmissions match everyone else, right? But his students from Basra, the transmissions are off. They're slightly off. That's, this is how uh, detailed the critiques were. So the Jarh and Ta'deel, system of what's called Jarh and Ta'deel, which means uh, attacking transmitters and rectifying others, okay, is so complex and so detailed OK, that uh, it's one of the miracles. It's really one of the miracles of our ummah that we produced such a a rigorous method of authenticating hadith. And you could get the books of Jonathan Brown and other uh, and others uh, that go into more detail. About these things. And what percentage of our information about the prophet um, and about his character and these types of things? <laughs> comes down to us from, you know, mutawatir narrations. There, is, there are mutawatir narrations and there are mutawatir facts, you can say. So, for example, the idea that the Prophet is buried in Medina, right? It, it's a mutawatir fact. The whole um, almost transmitted. The idea that, uh, you know, the Kaaba is where it is, okay, uh, that that's what the first Qibla was. Uh, or the, sec- uh, the second Qibla was. Uh, there are mutawatir facts, the facts that the Muslims spread out to Persia, all these. So there are mutawatir facts, but there are, the, as for the mutawatir hadith, that's what you're asking about, the actual mutawatir hadith. Uh, there are not going to be so many mutawatir hadith, but there are many mutawatir facts. Right? How to pray, for example, is a mutawatir fact. What a Muslim must cover right, is a mutawatir fact. Uh, the rituals of Hajj. So the Mutawatir Hadith will not be so many, but the mutu, the other realities that can be Mutawatir can become many. Language, the whole Arabic language and what words mean, right? You can say is a type of Tawatir, right? Passed on by Tawatir. The fact that Ahad means one and one in himself and unique in himself, right? You know, th- th- these types of facts, uh, are there. those are many. And the ahadith, not so many. Understood. But our, our, well, when we're trying to establish the prophethood and the these characteristics of the prophet, it, we would depend and rely on a, you know, a vast majority or a, a large amount of mutawatir narrations. Uh, there's a middle category. So narrations are not mutawatir and ahad only. There's a middle category called mustafil between the two. And there's the bulk of your religion right there. And mustafil has been defined in two different ways. One way is that it's not mutawatir in a sense that it's not a mass transmission, but at the same time, it's not a solitary transmission, but it's something. It's a number in between. That's one definition of mustafil. The second definition of mustafil is that it, it started as a solitary transmission, but its meaning was accepted and and corroborated and therefore everyone accepts it so it became a mass transmission so what's the best example of that definition is hadith of verily actions are by intentions right how many muslims know the hadith verily actions are by intentions transmitted by umar ibn khattab so that hadith it was uh an ahad hadith Omar transmitted it to one man who transmitted to another man who transmitted to another man that then everyone transmitted it from that man, the third man, right? So the question comes, 
how do you actually judge a uh, what is the reality of a of a mustafid hadith? So is it possible that this was a secret that the Prophet told Omar and nobody else? No. Actually, the Prophet said it in a khutbah, right? He said it in a khutbah. But not every listener of a khutbah is going to be a teacher, right? So he did say it in public. However, he did say the hadith, in al-amanu bin niyat. He said that statement in public, in a khutbah, attended by maybe a couple hundred people, okay? But is every person who attends a khutbah, does he transmit what he hears? No. And that transmitter must have students who transmit what he hears. So uh, that hadith may have been very well known, except that the transmission that stayed alive was a solitary. It was only one transmission stayed alive until it reached the one who spread it far and wide. So this is the re- understanding of ahad hadith that uh, can be in the middle between ahad and mutawatir. Ahad meaning a solitary transmission. So that we call that category mustafid and the bulk of our religion comes from ahadith that are mustafid. Okay. And I mean, even ahad has, you know, gharib and aziz and, and mashur. And I think uh, which and each of those, as far as I know, those have different number of narrators. So you mentioned terms like aziz, uh, gharib and mashur. Aziz being like one. Uh, as, uh, w- there's at some point, or gharib being at some point in the train, there's one person. Gharib is like at some point there's there's a minimum of two people, et cetera, et cetera. So you can say that there's might be an overlap between mashhur and mustafil. So the important thing is to note that there is a gradation, right? Uh, it's not going to be one thing. It's not going to be uh, either ahad or mutawatir, but the way that the early scholars used to treat hadith was that if it was a hadith of action or belief, then they needed to follow up on it, right? So they, if they heard a nice story, they wouldn't go and verify it. There's no need to verify a nice little story, right? But if they heard something that says a Muslim is not allowed to do X, Y, and Z, well, now that's something we need a reference for. So the hadith scholars would intentionally uh, – go and and seek out and do further research on hadith that imp, that either you did it or you didn't do it right so there were binary hadith that were that implied action that were imperatives do this or negative imperatives do not do this so there's no need to to follow up on a story okay so that's why most of sirah is not from sahih hadith so most stories are not sahih but there could be enough good enough to transmit so uh, if there was an imperative in the hadith and in something in act- what we can call actionable items, actionable items for us could also be beliefs. That's something we have to believe. Uh, the scholars followed up on those hadith. Okay? They, followed, they sought to verify those hadith more than others. And then ultimately, their conclusion, because act- the nature of actionable items is either go, green light, red light, right? that they needed to categorize the hadiths as, yes, good enough to act upon, good enough as, ev- strong enough as the transmission, strong enough as evidence, or not strong enough as evidence, right? So green light, red light. It's either a yes or no. So the first c- classification of hadith was sahih or saqim. That's it, right? E- either you do it or you don't, right? You act upon it or you don't. So uh, in that gradation, the scholars would look and look and look, and they would use judgment calls, and they would discuss matters amongst themselves, to see what happened. Okay, so I mean, kind of going back to the initial aspect that we were mentioning, um, even in Aqida, we we would we depend on something to be mass transmitted if we're gonna make it a part of our belief system or you know something that's actionable in other cases. So it seems that when we're going to develop a belief about the Prophet, then we would need to depend on something that we logically accept is mass transmitted and there's just no way it's incorrect. And yet the stories that help us establish these beliefs about the Prophet, they don't seem to be mass transmitted in that sense. I understand belief about the Prophet being someone that, you know, no, there's no Prophet after him or something like that. But in terms of that fun, that initial thing that you were mentioning about how you establish that this person is, you know, the characteristics that they have, which were that convince us that he's a Prophet. Those things which come to us in the Sirah, uh, it seems then those things are not established. In, in, the, in mass? Yeah, no, the criteria that we need. 
So we would categorize that as like a mustafid in that the people who actually saw it in the beginning may have been one or two. But the their acceptance of it as a generation, right, enters now into. So remember, mustafid hadith has one definition where something starts as a uh, not mutawatir, then becomes mutawatir because of a mass acceptance of it, right? So when you have an attribute of the Prophet ﷺ, such as his attributes before Islam, right? His attributes before he became a, uh, so before he received wahi and revelation. Yeah, uh, he was not famous, right? So few people, such as Sayyidina Ali, Sayyidina Khadija, uh, Abu Talib, those others, they knew the Prophet, peace be upon him. Those things about him, so at that level, was not mutawatir. However, it was accepted by an entire generation, and then it spread out um, to, to others, right? So because it was accepted, and there was no, you have to look at it the other way around, too. He had enemies, right? The statements of the enemies of the Prophet ﷺ were recorded. The scholars recorded them, right? Many of them are in the Quran. So we now look at the statements of the Prophet's honesty. Was it denied, decried? Was it something critiqued by his enemies? Did any of his enemies call him a liar, right? Uh, et cetera, et cetera. So it begins. So not only are you looking at uh, the mustafid that starts as of only a few but spreads. You have to look for the opposite. Did anyone make the opposite claim about the Prophet, peace be upon him? Right? And the absence of the opposite claim. And the presence of the attacks that they made is an indicator that their attacks were preserved. Right? So the Muslims preserved, the Quran itself preserves some of their attacks on the Prophet. So that's one thing. But uh, or those are two points about that. What about... Um, an example. Can you give me an example uh, of something that we rely upon to believe in the Prophet that is not mutawatir? Oh, no. I mean, I was just going off what you were saying about earlier aspects of about the seerah and also about characteristics of the Prophet. Because, I mean, kind of going back also to what you had said initially, you said that a large group of, it's impossible for a large group of people to conspire. And yet some aspects of the things that we know about the Prophet, which we used to you know, say that he has prophetic characteristics even before Islam, um, those seem to be from among a small group of people. And so the principle that a large group of people cannot conspire kind of falls apart at that point because it's not we're not dealing anymore with the large group of people. We're dealing with a very small group of people. So th whether there is or not some type of conspiracy then becomes more, uh, it could be more possible at that stage. Correct? Yeah, you, you bring up a good point and the uh, answer to that, or the real, the main answer to that, uh, the main answer to that is that that's the character of the Prophet Sallallahu is not the only pillar upon our belief, right? That may have been the main pillar for the early Muslims' belief, right? But the pillar for a person's belief are far more than just that. So a mutawatir is is even even if you had a mutawatir, it wouldn't be sufficient, right? Because you, we need to have belief on multiple fronts, okay? A person doesn't enter Islam or stay Muslim on one belief solely. So what I said about the rational proofs for God's existence is one leg. If we went into the the biography of the Prophet Sallallahu okay, it is consistent enough, okay, to be a leg. Not the only leg, but a leg, okay? The uh, prophecies of end, of the end times, by the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, right, that we see in before us, right, is Alek, okay, the miracles of the Qur'an, from ex for example, it's its own prophecies, its own statements about the past that the Prophet could not have known, its own consistency with the world as we know it, which was not known to the, uh, in the time of the Prophet, peace be upon him, okay, is Alek. The experience, uh, spiritual experiences, which is something that, you know, we're exiting the academic or the realm of ideas completely. We're getting into now spiritual experience. Is it the only leg? No, but it's a leg, okay? Anecdotal evidence, which is the interaction with actual Muslims and the, the actual, uh, what actually happens on the ground, okay? It, when you live as a Muslim or with Muslims, okay? And you live and you follow the uh, precepts of Islam is a leg, right? So, 
when, whenever one of these legs is attacked for being weak or not strong enough, okay, then we notice, we say that, look, it's strong enough to be a leg. It doesn't need to be the whole leg. You wouldn't, if you had a chair and you only had one leg, that leg would break on your weight. But when you divide it into four, right, or five or six, this is, these are the basis for why Muslims either stay in the, in the deen or that Allah, ta, or they, they convert into the deen. Okay, some of them are social, some of them like anecdotal, some of them are spiritual, and some of them are rational. Okay, and some of them are scriptural. So okay. we have many legs, so we don't have to worry about the nitty gritty details. When you look at the Prophet, peace be upon him, the, the biographies are sufficient, right? To, the, it, you calculate all these biographies. It's going to have to be a really grand scale conspiracy to uh, try to state that his his general biography uh, and general description is a fairy tale and a, a hoax, right? Okay, and then it, any of these qualities, any of these legs, if they're present in other people who espouse a, an incorrect um, theology uh, or, or view about God, if they're present in those people, it doesn't yeah. it doesn't necessarily mean that they're prophets or anything like that. So well, when it's present, in- yeah. Sh- show me one phenomenon that has all of the legs that Islam has. Like, for example, you can give me Christianity, and, and at the Trinity, uh, the issue of logic and reason you know, starts to break down. Okay, Show me their transmission of their Bible in their language, in the original language of Revelation. Show me the documentation, the Asani, the Jarh and Ta'adil tradition uh, that they possess. But show me the anecdotal evidence? Yeah, we could show you. We could show you that the Catholics are even better at charity than the Muslims, right? Okay, so they have anecdotal evidence. Do they have, does the Catholic way of living, or the Christian way of living in general, does it support families uh, existing together? Yeah, they do. You know, I go out in the town where I live in, and the Protestant families and the Catholic families, they're very family-oriented, and they're, the people who go to the church, the church supports their family. So they do have that. They do have social uh, equity in, or in the sense of, uh, reputation in terms of giving back to society and helping the poor. They do have a better, uh, faithful Christians and faithful Jews do have better emotional states, right? The idea of, you know, of, of them being, you know, having po- some more positive emotions and mental state is there. But do they have documentation of their, their holy book? No. Do they have a unity of their scripture? No, right? Do they have anything near uh, the globalism? that Islam has in Hajj? No, right? So it's it's all about this well-rounded uh, front, this well-rounded uh, approach when we look at why people stay or enter into the deen. You cannot find a single movement, right, that possesses, that is as well-rounded as the deen of Islam. Bring me anything rational, okay? Like, let's say you get bring me a, a airtight, rational idea, like, let's say, secular humanism, right? Well, we're covered in origin story. We have psychology. We have our own economic system. We have our own legal system, blah, 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 blah. All right. Do you have answers to the purpose of life? You all utterly fail. Do you have a, a outlet for the poor? Like, you know, what is it, what is life like for a poor secularist? I could tell you for a poor Muslim. Right, he's got to wait out his days, and he knows that his hisab will be much easier, right? That's what the belief has done, right? That's what he believes. That's what we believe, right? If I if things are not going well for me, all I have to do is wait out my days, and I know akhirah is going to be better for me, right? I know I'm being comp- I'm going to be rewarded for this patience. Uh, the poor in a secular world, who are they seeking for help? Who do they go to for help? If you're a spiritual in a secular world, where are you going? So, yeah, America, you could say the, the, the as a civilization, right? Okay, they, they may have trounced Muslim countries in many spheres, but they can, are they offering any spirituality? No. Are they offering any purpose to life? No. Are they any, offering any outlet for those whose material state is bad? No. So you, you have to keep looking at the balance and well-roundedness that the Prophet's message. This is why the Prophet ﷺ said, Layluha kanahariha. He said, it's night is like it's day, which means when things are, no matter how things are, good, bad, or ugly, the truthfulness of the message is crystal clear. 
Okay. Even when things are terribly bad, the truthfulness of the message and the nature of the actual message is crystal clear. And he said, nobody goes away from this except he wants to. He wants to destroy himself, right? He, he didn't say, لا يزيب عنها إلا هلك. If he said that, it would have meant nobody goes astray from this path except that he's destroyed. But no, he says, إلا هلك. Someone who wants to be destroyed. You know, someone who wants to go away from this path. I mean, to, someone once said, okay, all your Ottomans and Abbasids enforced Islam. And that's why it spread, because you forced it in the governments. I said, subhanAllah, this is why Allah Ta'ala, the wisdom of his ordaining the de utter destruction of all of these monarchies, khilafas, whatever you want to call it, that upheld the deen of Islam. is because now the governments in the Arab countries are, they might even be against Islam. If you keep going to Masajid, you're going to be in trouble in Cairo, right? You might end up in the back of a, of a, of a, of a jail, uh, a police car, okay? And in a jail cell, if you keep going to the Masajid. In, so the governments, you could say, are against these things. In the UAE, you can't have gatherings in your home anymore, according to what one man there told me, right? If it's a gathering and something religious happened, it better be, you know, by accident and nobody better know. But you can't go and have a class in your house. So these governments oftentimes are against the, the uh, flowering of Islam. The, and the, in the West, of course, they have no support. We have no support at all. So what is that? Tell us that tells us that Islam is being established by people, by the individuals, by the people, not by governments. So that's the wisdom of this era that we're in right now, is that it shows us that that argument that, yeah, you only establish Islam because you have the form of government is false. It would have been dead, you know, uh, decades ago, if that was the case, if it truly relied on governments to keep it alive. But no, religions never rely on governments. They're strengthened by governments. They're protected by governments, but they never rely upon government. Religions are in the hearts of people, right? They survive in the people, but they can be protected, they can grow, and they can be strengthened by governments. How do we know that God communicates to mankind and or to people his creation? And you answered this somewhat when you're describing God, but in a more, you know, how, how would you establish something like this? And how do you establish that those beings are infallible? Actually, you already answered that also. So it's up to you if you want to answer it again. Okay, so it's the, the question is, um, you know, how does a person, let's say a person comes to believe in God. How do I know that God communicates with people, right? Well, the answer is there is a whole historical tradition of that claim. The claim is called prophethood. Right. That's the claim. Nubuwa literally means to tell the future. So how do we know that a prophet is true uh, in his statement? Right? If, if the prophet is true. What what is the only thing that is outside of that is in the possession of none, nobody but the creator himself? The future. Right. The future is the one thing that is absolutely outside of all of our control. Okay. So it's only in God's hands. So the idea of how prophets proved themselves was by telling the proof of uh, the future. They tell you the future that what's going to happen okay, in the future. And you wait. And if it happens, all right, that's one maybe got lucky. Let's try it again. Tells you another thing. Wait till it happens. Then it happens. And this happens three, four, five, six, seven times that everyone for everyone is going to be different. But for me, you know, four, five, six, seven demonstrations of something is enough. One is not enough. Two is not enough. Right. Three, we're getting there. But once you hit four, five, six, seven, um, you start moving away from the ahad and you're starting to move into a more rigorous uh, thing where it's hard to have, you know, got lucky that many times. So this is actually the reason we, they're called prophets, because they tell you about the future, because that's the only thing that you need. I need to prove, prove to me that you're talking to God. Well, I will show you something that is only in the possession of God, which is the future. Okay? So this is why the main bread and butter of prophets is to tell their people the future. And our prophecies came, the prophecies of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam came for his Sahaba. Some came for the early generations of Muslims. Some came for the middle generations, in the middle era. And many, 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 when the faith is very weak and too many centuries have passed, 
have come for the people of the end of time. Okay, Many prophecies have come for the people of the end of time because in that time period, there's so many centuries have passed that people don't know what to believe anymore. And so these prophecies serve as their uh, lifeline. Okay, So you, it's analog, uh, analyzing prophets and the claim. Okay, And the first analysis that you have to make is, is anything ev that's even said about these prophets true? Okay, so, all right, Buddha, was he a prophet? Well, let's examine the Buddha. The first thing I'm going to lo look at all the books about him, there's no historicity there, right? There is no rigorous transmission. I have to rely on the translator or the editor, right, or the author. I, there's no actual rigorous transmission uh, that the Buddha existed and said what he's what they're claiming he said. When we look at all the prophetic claims, all of them, all of the ancient prophets, none of them have a transmission that you know we can accept, except the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And then you have all a lot of like Elijah Muhammad. Yeah, we can we can make sure that we know he existed and we see what he said. Um, Mirza Ahmed, Mirza Ghulam Al Qadiani. Yeah. We could probably do that. There was a couple prophets in Britain. We got the Mormon guy who said he was a prophet from God. And we have uh, John Smith. We have a, a number of people. So let's take a look at them, all of them, right? Let's take a look at all of them. Now, first thing, did their prophecies con contradict the reality? So you can't just make prophecies. You have to be flawless in your prophecies. N namely, your prophecies cannot have become in, come in the reverse, so Nostradamus, for example, he made prophecies, but as Allah has willed, his prophecy, uh, you know, uh, project falls apart in the introduction of his book. When he says that in like 300 years, Europe will be in a great famine and there won't even be enough people to farm and the society will be basically be very few people scrapping uh, to live. Well, the exact opposite happened 300 years later. You know, the Industrial Revolution happened. So we can throw out everything he says after that. So all the prophets have to be free from making mistakes in prophethood. So, but all of that ends up in the discussion of uh, getting re revelation directly from God. But the idea of God speaking to people and communicating to people is not just limited to that, right? So we have, we have the belief that Allah can hear us and relay messages to us in his own way, which will not be revelation. Okay. How? By you make dua, and Allah answers your dua. You start to believe Allah's hearing me. You're thinking about something and pondering about it, and lo and behold, you walk into Jum'ah, and the Khatib speaks about it. Now this, again, once or twice, not a, not, doesn't move the needle. But in the course of a person's life, and you ask any Muslim, I'm telling you, ask Muslims who are even spotty about their prayers, right? They will tell you that many times in their lives, right, they believe that Allah Ta'ala was hearing them and has answered them, right? And it's almost to the point that it's not even like news, right? It's not even something, it's like, subhanAllah, Allah, I know that Allah now uh, it, it, it has, has heard my dua, and you feel comfort again. Right. And it's not even news. It's not like a huge big deal. I to write a book about it, make a shrine. Right. All that stuff. You know, so uh, there is the religious message, which is the actual religions. And then for that, you examine the prophets and you also have to examine if it's working. Right. Like you know, some of these movements are, you know, they, they just are defunct. Right. Are they actually benefiting? So that's one thing. Second thing is the individual idea that the, that Allah Ta'ala is with us, is watching us, is answering us, is, is sending us communication, right? Uh, so that's, those are, that's the second thing, and that's the lived experience. That requires a lived experience of Islam. You had said that uh, if there was two gods, then there would be chaos, because there'd be conflict between the two gods. How do we establish that to be the case? Any two wills any two wills must clash, okay? And if the wills do not clash and they're working in a perfect partnership, 
then one of them is redundant. And if he's redundant, then he's not a god. He's not absolutely independent. He becomes dependent upon another god. Okay? So either he's going to become dependent, therefore not worthy of worship, right? Why would I worship someone who needs an assistant? He's weak without his assistant, right? So he becomes unworthy of worship. However, so either he becomes unworthy, if they're working together, he becomes unworthy of worship. If they are uh, uh, together but not working together, uh, but not on the same line, then we're going to witness a conflict at some point, right? We would witness some conflict between the two, some damage in the universe, but we don't witness are we, it. Are we imposing human understandings of conflict and of differences in will onto our understanding of divine celestial beings? Well, that comes... Is, Okay, th that point comes all the time of, are we imposing our own logic to God? And the answer is, we're not imposing it. It's the only thing we have, right? Because the moment you say that we're, we cannot impose our understanding of things to God, then we can't have any discussion at all, right? Then w what about our understanding of existence, our understanding of knowledge, our understanding of goodness, right? So uh, logic and language is all we have. To, discuss, to have a discussion. If you unseat them, right, then there's no discussion. And this always comes with uh, when we talk about the divine attributes and someone says, uh, are you, you're imposing your own understanding of being above the throne, right? You're, own, you're imposing your own understanding of aboveness, right? Above and location. You're only you're imposing your own understanding of location, right? Your human understanding of location. We say, no, I mean, Allah uses words. If we are going to dislodge words, then cancel all discussions. Because when, when we say the word above or location, it by necessity implies volume, right? It implies matter. It implies reference, there, that there's a, a reference point, right? It implies a reference point. You cannot say uh, above, but above what? It requires a reference point. So uh, that subject always comes up. And the answer to it is, if you're going to go that route, then cancel all the discussions. Right. So we know what conflict is where we're, we have a set of brains, an intellect and we have a language. This is what Allah has given us to come to know him, intellect and language. So the notion and the idea of negating what we know as logical and as language in our discussion of anything, you end up negating the whole discussion. Does this make sense? Yeah. Were we given the choice of free will? If we were, then on what basis did we choose? I.e., what initial nature did we have that influenced our choice in choosing whether we want free will or not? And who well, gave us that nature? Did we have well, a choice in that nature? Well, that question is a question that can only be answered by revelation, right? By wahi. And our wahi... Uh, tells us the Quran tells us so based on so the, the the what I'm about to say is basically the premise for it is the truthfulness of the Quran uh, and that is basically that there is a time in which Allah Ta'ala offered al-amana which is oftentimes interpreted as being free will the will to do good and bad as um, to be able to obey God or disobey him and he offered it to the heavens, the earth, the mountains. They all rejected it. But the human being accepted it. The human being accepted it. And therefore, the answer to your question is that, yes, the human being as a type, as a, a archetypal creature. Now, you're asking me, how? Was, were we all there? I, who, Allah who knows best, right? That uh, all the souls were there and accepted it? Allah knows best. Uh, but the human being accepted free will. And therefore, we chose to have free will. But we have to accept that on a belief. None of us remember that choice, right? But if we have accepted Allah and the Quran, uh, then we will accept that we did accept it. So it's not an answer I can, we can give to an, a skeptic atheist where we're using reason only, but it is an answer we can give to the believers, right? To the mu'mini. Wahi is a source of knowledge that scientists generally disregard. Other forms of knowing can, generally speaking, be reproduced, proven, or disproven. The same cannot be said for wahi. If we establish wahi as a way of knowing, do we have to accept it from everyone who claims to have it? 
No, that's why we said that uh, the claim of wahi is by prophethood. And the prophet demonstrates, like the scientists want demonstrations, right? He demonstrates that he is speaking to the creator by telling us repeatedly the future. That's one, only one avenue of belief in him, right? So there is a type of demonstration and scientific method to the process of accepting or rejecting a prophet. And this is where all religions start to, their believers start to have trouble, okay, when time passes, okay? Because when you start quoting incidents and events that happened so far back in the past, right, then, you know, it's it's not as strong as if it, you're quoting something that happened like three days ago or three months ago or three years ago. But we do have the manuscripts of these prophecies. So you end up with uh, e, uh, a couple of options. Number one, the prophet himself gambled on himself, on his own re- uh, claim, and then uh, happened to come true many, many times over 30, 40, 50 times. So you have to believe, accept that. Or accept that the uh, the uh, transmitters, the scribes, the muhaddithin, the narrators, they themselves made, took gambles on behalf of their prophet and made up prophethood, prophecies, and happened to be correct as well. And on top of that, that the transmitters happened to make the same prophecy by coincidence. Transmitter from Yemen, transmitter from Persia, transmitter from Egypt, transmitter from Mecca, transmitter from Syria, all ended up making the same, inventing the same prophecy, taking a gamble on their prophet at the same time, right? Uh, With the same prophecy and became correct, right? Turned out by luck of the draw that they were correct. So you have to believe that or that the Prophet Muhammad actually did utter these words that are in the manuscripts that we see and that the Hadith transmitters did loyally transmit them and that they're true and therefore he is a prophet. So these are the... uh, that that is there is a method to belief. It's not a random thing. Okay, but there are a number of prophecies which haven't yet come into fruition. Uh, yeah, many prof- of the major ones. Prophet- so, uh, is prophet- there a criterion that we have to uh, look at when we're deciding, you know, how we judge whether prophecy is truly a prophecy or if it's, you know, something that someone is saying that might come but it never actually comes? How do we? Is there like a time limit? How exactly yeah. do we establish something like that? Yeah, you the, the idea of a prophethood not occurring does not negate the prophethood. The idea that, or the claim of prophet, the idea of a prophet's a prophecy becoming the opposite, right? The opposite. That's what negates the claim of a prophet. Okay. So if if the if the transmission is rigorous, right, and then the event occurs, but occurs in the opposite form then we can say that the claim of prophethood is uh, false. And he's a false prophet, right? So that's what, uh, that's the only thing you have to worry about. But as for claims, a could, claim could come in 100 years, could 200 years and 300 years, 500 years or whatever. So that, does, that doesn't negate it. But the uh, sound prophet uh, set, of, set of prophecies will cover the, near fu- the immediate future the near future, the distant future, and the very distant future. And that's what we have. We have prophecies for all of these phases. You have prophecies for the classical period, such as the conquest of uh, Byzantium, uh, uh, Constantinople. You have prophecies for the beginning of time that happened in his time, while he's alive. You have prophecies that manifested you know, to, uh, within the first two centuries. And you have the bulk of prophets, uh, prophecies having in, the, in, in our times, in the end of times. And you have the major ones not having appeared yet, yet at all. Understood. And when it comes to God's justice, God creates people knowing that they will enter hell or heaven. How is it the person's fault if he ends up in hell? At the end of the day, we have no control of the stories being written for our character. So I create characters in this story that will eventually end up in hell. So this is the classical question on uh, predestination. And the answer to it is that the knowledge of God does not conflict with our free will. Right? So the knowledge of God, 
does not he, he, the fact that he has knowledge of our action does not con uh, conflict with our free will. Okay. Now people will then say, okay, fine. The knowledge of God does not conflict with our free will, but God knew that certain people would take this action and then go to hell and suffer. So because God allowed suffering, he's a bad God. That's really the next step because the first one doesn't really uh, change anything. That's the, you know easy. The idea that separating between God's will or, or our free will and God's knowledge. We see this all the time. But the real question being, why would God allow that? And the question is, and this only comes from the entitled mentality that a good God is one who gives pleasure, right? Constant pleasure. That's what a good God is, okay? And that he takes away hardship and harm. Well, if that happened, then we would, then he's also taking away free will, right? If every time you willfully harmed yourself, okay, then he stopped you because he's a good God, then he's actually taken away your free will, right? And when he takes away your free will by, for example, telling us, not even forcing us, telling us don't drink, <coughs> wear hijab, don't skip prayers, don't commit zina, then you say, well, he's trapped me with these laws, right? So uh, a human being, the, the, the project of the human being is all about a being having free will and is not free will if he comes now to interfere with every time you harm yourself, including the greatest harm, which is rejecting belief and uh, dying and going to, to hell. Right? That's the greatest harm. So he's not denying either one. In order to have truly have free will, okay, and test this creation, then he has to allow all the consequences to take place. Now look at this. Whenever a government comes and says, okay, khilaf or whatever, we're going to have Islam, this is Islam, everything that's a heresy, we're going to remove from the society, okay? Any, you know, like uh, Qadiani books, Shia books will be removed from the library, all right? You know, um, Quran-only websites will be shut down. Wouldn't the uh, critics and the liberals and the atheists all tell us, well, why don't you allow your religion to, you know, you know, make it, you know, make itself known in the free market of ideas that it's correct, you know, in the free market of ideas, like remove all artificial stops and artificial or government forced, you know, uh, monitors and filters, right? That's what they would say, right? So likewise, in the same vein, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created us with the world and he has told us, do, i'malu, right? Do what you're going to do, okay? But you're going to face your consequences. Amalu, do act. Everyone will will get the consequences of their action. Now, when the consequence comes, okay, and you don't like it, you can't come back and say, "Well, God, why did you do this?" Okay. So this is the idea between the existence of free will and the existence of God's knowledge, and the existence of suffering and the existence of free will. So suffering and free will are going to be uh, suffering and free will are, are tied to the hip. And that includes suffering in this life and in the next, facing the consequences. It's not really free will, okay, if right at the end, you know, someone comes and cancels the whole thing because it went bad. That's not free will. Now, kind of going back with uh, the initial question that we were discussing, is the act of creation itself then unjust? Because the created things they have the potential of either going to hell or heaven and you create this potential for them when you bring them into existence and some might say that as a result that existence itself could be unjust and kind of going back to the initial point that we were mentioning about selecting free will it seems that if there's a nature given to you by god and according to that nature you choose to have free will then even at that point, it's really not you because there's no such thing as you. It's whatever God gives you that forms who you are. Mm -hmm. And so kind of going back to that, I mean, is that also just if God knows what you're going to do with the tool that you're given? I mean, whether or not what how this ties into predestination, which I think is a, a bit of a different topic. 
but the the, the the very act of selecting free will wasn't had no free will associated with it since the nature that you used to select that this this thing of free will which other you know created things like mountains uh decide said they don't want well the um nothing that creator does can ever be unjust because justice requires you know multiple parties right so if the the once you are the owner of something then you can do what you wish to it people may like it or not like it that's very different from just and unjust right they could like it or they could not like it he created you as a male you can like it or not like it right he created you as a female you can like it or not like it but it's not unjust it's 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 rationally impossible to make a claim that creation is unjust you could like it or not like it right and that that really goes back up to the person what's the relationship between allah and his attributes has he always had these attributes even yes. before doing the action which necessitated the attribute good question he, and, uh, yeah finish it if he's outside of time how can he have the attribute of the one who delays uh, and if he's outside of creation, physical creation, how can he be? How can he have the attribute of the creator? Good question. And the answer is that the meaning of divine attributes is that he has the capability of doing so. So the creator means he is capable of creation. That's what creator means. Okay. The uh, all the other attributes that are relative means that he possesses the capability of doing those things. So uh, all of his attributes are with him pre-eternally. None of them uh, come into being after he has done the act. So, for example, you're you're not a podcaster until you make a podcast, right? You're not a winner until you win, right? So, uh, in contrast with the creator, he is a creator even before he created, all right? Because the, the meaning is that he possesses the capability of creation, the ability to, to make and create. But then there would be an infinite number of things that he has the potential to do, which don't end up making it into the list of attributes that he has. For example, he can make something go faster. Yeah. But that's not a... That's not a um, a, uh, an attribute that he has yeah so um in terms of those things that you just said that for example making things go faster now all of these things all of the attributes of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala there are name should not be con- confused with names of attribute names divine names divine names and divine attributes are not the same uh so the name of names of Allah Ta'ala are what how, how he referred to himself or how he is referred to in the hadith. However, the attributes of Allah Ta'ala is much broader, right? Anything that is true about the creator is one of his attributes, right? So the, the statement that he can make automobiles or our mode of communication faster, that whole phrase is a true attribute of God. It is his attribute. It's not, his, it's not a name. He never referred to himself as uh, you know, like al musarri or whatever you would call it, but it is an attribute, right? So uh, attributes are almost eternal, as eternal as things that exist. Uh, with one little caveat is that it's disrespectful to refer to an, uh, an attribute or to describe him with an attribute of a lowly thing, like creator of the cockroach, right? Things like that. That's considered blasphemous as disrespectful because it's not a nice thing even though we do believe he created the cockroach second point is that everything that uh, all of the attributes all come down to a few the the rationally uh comprehensible attributes so for example qudra his create uh, al-khaliq the creator is a function of al-qadr right the qudra his his attribute of al-qudra so the attributes end up all rooting back to one of the uh rationally comprehensible attributes qudra irada ilm haya right uh sam'a basar so all of these things so for example al-khaliq al-bari' al-musawwir all of that 
goes to rooted in qudra, irada, and ilm. Right? So all of the names and attributes will go back. And Imam al-Bayhaqi, in uh, one of his books on the 99 names, he, or, or I think he only has one book on the 99 names, but in that book, he, he talks about that. And for every attribute that he goes to, he roots it in one of the rationally comprehensible attributes. And as for your third question, which was, some of the names seem to be to mean that uh, he is perpetually creating, right? He is perpetually forgiving. He is perpetually being generous, right? So, yeah, that is the true when the creation exists, right? When the when he has because because even that is a time bound thing, right? So when time-bound creatures come to existence, then he is perpetually creating. When sinners come into existence, then he's perpetually forgiving. So the idea of the question of where does it come in when we call him the perpetual this or the, the he's always creating, always forgiving, things like that, that form is, uh, uh, it is still true, right, when that thing exists, that he is capable of that if that thing exists. So, okay, so what happens when everyone is out of hell who's going to be forgiven is out of hell and everyone else is in heaven, right? Is he still al-ghafir, the, the always forgiving? Yes, as long as there are sinners, he's always forgiven. Okay. And how does God, who is outside of creation, interact with creation via his attributes? I.e., is he both inside and outside? transcendent and imminent how does this relationship work he is transcendent beyond his creation and those all of those um is he separate or uh, uh what is what was it separate or um is he transcendent or is he attached? imminent is he operating within yeah um, so and how does this relationship work most of these uh words both of them are negated both of them are impossible. So is he connected or disconnected from his creation? Both are impossible right? because both imply, both of them imply existence and creation or uh, both imply to be being made of matter, right? So uh, uh, they are, they're not, uh, you know, things that can exist, uh, can be possible. So, and it's not the excluded middle either because the excluded middle is that uh, both of them are possible, but neither are true. Okay, or one of them must be true. Okay, so neither when both of them are impossible, then it's not the excluded middle. So it's like saying um, you have a choice of being a rapist or a murderer, right? It's it's neither. So by saying neither, it's not the excluded middle. So God has the uh, is is above us or below us. That's if he's so. That's both impossible. So the idea of created and in, uh, un, uh, or connected and disconnected, both of them are impossible. So the question itself is the proposition itself. The question itself uh, is on a false premise. So God knows that you're going to end up in hell or heaven, mm -hmm. and you're still going to do what you're going to do. Now there are times in your life where you feel. You're very pious, and you might very well be very pious, but God knows you're in hell. But in that particular moment when you're feeling pious and when you're doing good things and when you are Muslim, what's God's relationship with you? Does He not really care, or any feelings that you have of, you know, uh, feeling closest to God, or they're all fake feelings? Because at the end of the day, God knows that you're going to end up in hell. So how is how is His relationship with His creation um, in the moment when that person is doing a lot of good things, even though God knows where that person is going to end up ultimately? <clears throat> Allah Adam, it's not a question that, uh, uh, it's more of a curiosity question, which probably most likely would come under the question, uh, answer of, they don't ask about, uh, the states of Allah do not change. It's not like an emotional state, right? Um, they don't change. We're not. We don't ask about what is happening in the depths of Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. And that person, he better off 
uh, believe, instead of thinking of what does God think of me, even though I'm going to hell, he better off believe in the hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, right? Uh, which mean those two hadiths which state that dua can change destiny. So a person reads in the Lohal Mahfuz that he's going to hell, right? Right after he's done the 27th night of Ramadan and there's tears wetting his beard, right? And there's nur beaming from his face. And he loves his Lord so much. And the angel comes and says, I have something to show you. Okay. And that is, your destiny is to go to hell. That person, if his thought process now is, it should not be, you know, well, what was God thinking when I was doing all this ibadah, right? That's not his the right question to ask. That is the dumb question to ask. That's an insignificant question to ask, irrelevant question to ask. The relevant question to ask is, whenever I see something in the Loh al-Mahfuz and an angel shows me something, is there any way I could, is there, do I have any willpower? Can I exert willpower and, and change it, right? And the answer is, number one, if the angel showed you one part of the Loh al-Mahfuz, doesn't mean he showed you all of the Loh al-Mahfuz, right? So you might not know, right, uh, that, uh, that that's permanent, okay? And number two, their focus should be upon the hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, right? nothing uh, repels uh, divine or qadr, predestination, except prayer, dua. So you should believe that that can change. And there was a story told about a man from Bani Israel who worshipped Allah, for uh, lived for hundreds of years, and he worshipped Allah Ta'ala. And he then uh, was told by the angels said, oh Allah, we want to see his reward. Can we look at his reward in, par- uh, in the Loh al-Mahfud? He said, yes, you may look at it. So they turned to the page for his reward in the future, and they saw that he's going to help. So they began to be so af- upset, so nervous, so anxious, so startled, so stunned, and sad for this man who worshipped Allah so well. That they went and they asked, can we tell him so that at least he could, you know, enjoy the last few days because he's about to die, you know, and at least, you know, relax himself. Allah said, yes. They came down while he was worshiping and these two malaika and he recognized them as angels from heaven. And they said, we have something to share with you. Mukashifa, basically. And they said, we have looked into the loh and look what Allah has decreed. After all of this ibadah, you are going to hell. He turned away from them and continued doing exactly what he was doing with no change in what he was doing. And they left. A couple days later, they came back down to him. They said, we told you if you're going to hell and you haven't changed any of your routine. Why don't you enjoy this life? The few pleasures that you have left before you go to hell. He said... I worship Allah Ta'ala as my duty, and Allah Ta'ala places me wherever he wills. It's my job to do my duty, and not my job to worry about his duty, right? Or, subhanAllah, not his duty, but his will. It's not not my job to do his will and worry about his will. It's my job to do what I'm ordered to do. This example, the angels then went back to Allah, and they informed Allah Ta'ala, about what he said, right? About duty and you know and his his discipline and what his job was. So Allah Ta'ala, he said, Now I permit you to look deeper into his book. And he looked and he said that this whole being informed of hellfire is also part of his predestination and that it was a test for him and that he in fact is going to the foot of Dose. So the idea of trying to think of what's in God's mind is a irrelevant, insignificant idea. It's one of the types of topics that someone who's truly not interested in belief, heaven and hell would ask those types of questions. And so, uh, you know, we would couch it in that in that framework. And for those if that's the type of person who's asking the question, then we have no interest in asking. He's not our audience. Uh, so we don't need to answer him. And if he is someone who is actually a mu'min, then we say, do your job. You know, don't worry about Allah Ta'ala. Do, you do your job. And and don't ask don't ask or don't uh, question or try to get into what's in God's mind. 
Okay. We don't have access to the Prophet other than reports. We can't possibly see a miracle from his hands to accept the truthfulness of Islam. The only thing we do have access to is the purported greatest miracle of the, of the Prophet, however, which is the Quran. But even then, since most Muslims are not Arabic speakers, and even then, if they are, there's just no way they have the same level of proficiency of the Arabs at the time of the Prophet. How are we meant to appreciate and access the Quran? Never mind, be convinced of the veracity of Islam thereby. Okay, this is pretty big. But um, I have to go to soccer practice. Pick uh, up another time or yeah. suffice with what you have here. Uh, Sheikh, thank you so much for your time. My uh, pleasure.